can just complain about the same shit while we're live. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. Ooh, there's some yeah. crinkling happening. Oh, my Twitch looks different. How does my Twitch look different? Because that full moon. Seriously, like, what changed. the hell is going on? All of the it's things are lining up to sure. just not work. Yeah, seriously, it's fucking. I mean, this stream started out really great when I had to restart OBS, because that's always a fun ritual that I like to have, where it's like, Hello, OBS. Thank you for working. Oh, you're frozen. Oh, must restart. It's just like a very <laughs> comforting routine. Yeah. There's not many things that are consistent in this world. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the right way to look at it. Yeah. Hello, Claire. Welcome. Ooh, are those your... Are those new emotes? They look different. They're cute. I like those. They're yeah, really those cute. Yeah, those are adorable. I like the little shaky army one in the second. The, in the middle. In the second. In the middle. I can't even <laughs> find my words today. This is going to be great. This is going to go great. <laughs> You're doing so good. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Words and stuff. Guys, we were just talking about, you know, not being used to the hour change yet. So my brain is totally fuzzy. I may bust out Yoda speech because things are going to come out out of order. So just be prepared. Luckily, I know Bianca understands that. So <laughs> it's true. I'm fluent in many forms of Star Wars languages. <laughs> I feel like that's a useful skill to have. It totally is, for sure. I mean, uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Doubtful. <laughs> what well, is on our circle? Yeah. It's hot. It is hot, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, greetings, Curious Crab, and welcome to another episode of Nerds Are Us 2.0, our non-podcast podcast, where we take a closer look at our favorite nerd communities, put a spotlight on some amazing creators, hint, hint, and try to do our part to make fandom a better place. I am Rach, that is Ronnie, and we have a returning guest, the mistress of the rom-com bracket herself, Bianca, yay! Yes, oh, that this was is loud. the woman that tortured us. <laughs> This year, I did have a co-host, so yes. uh, two people got to torture you this year, and I think that is sometimes even more fun. Uh, yes, it it was uh, more torture. <laughs> the torture was enhanced. It was shared. It was yes. spread around more. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was really great to have Ali um, and like the Realm Ever After podcast co-host. Yes. Uh, was I liked it. It was good. I think that like. No. no person is an island. Um, yeah. No suffering should be limited to one person's enjoyment. <laughs> That's very much appreciated for sure. <laughs> and it and it, it and it did end up being um, going like a lot differently than I think I anticipated. I'm not sure. Rach, did you follow it all the way through? Like there was there were some left turns in there. Where I was just like, wow, this is where we're going. Okay then. <laughs> Yeah, there were, so. there were some very surprising outcomes, but I mean, there were, when we filled it out on our stream, there were many yeah. where we were like, don't make me decide, and we like flipped a pog to decide, because yeah. we're, because we're millennials, and therefore we, I had a pog lying around, um, but, <laughs> as you do, yeah, yeah, as, as, as all millennials do, um, yeah, because we, we were just like, we refused to choose, and so it, we just let the pog, the Yoko pog of wonder Yoko decide. Pog, yeah. Poor Yoko. <laughs> she got dragged into the middle. <laughs> Thank Always you. Does. Thank uh, you, Yoko, for providing us our pog of decision making. Indeed. Indeed. Absolutely. All right. Well, 
Um, if you guys aren't familiar with Bianca, we absolutely adore her. We love having her on. She is absolutely one of my favorites and I want to marry her. So her husband needs to watch out. Um, I always have to drop that in there just to make it weird. Okay, so it's fine. I think that you're, you know, <laughs> your many people who will buy for that slot should it ever become vacant. <laughs> um so okay it happens to be women's history month and fair warning again guys after losing the the hour my brain's still not 100 percent, and it's a full moon tonight so god knows just you know i don't know do do just pray for to whatever it is that you pray to and just hope that this goes well <laughs> because words and candles. stuff yep yep do whatever it is that you do buy yeah. yourself something nice like whatever you need sacrifice something whatever it is that you need to do <laughs> oh my order delivery <laughs> potatoes are great carbs in general Wine. are really good yeah, yeah it's true it's a fact sugar carbs liquor. i ordered myself pastries today i literally like <gasps> duck out of a meeting for a second because i was like sorry the delivery person's here yeah. like i had to order myself sugar because it's been that kind of a week and everyone's I like mean, it's fine that's so. understandable totally understandable for sure i probably should have had some sort of caffeinated something before we logged on but here i am um okay so it is women's history month and we wanted to um invite some of our favorite ladies bianca will be our first this week and we have two other incredible ladies that we're inviting on for the rest of the month um, that we think are iconic themselves, and we wanted them to come on and talk about other iconic women. So um, there, there's a multitude of ways that this conversation can go, and I was kind of having a hard time last night on picking just one direction. And so the way that we typically do these is just to try to keep them as organic as possible and have them go whichever direction it is that it just, they're meant to go. Uh, plus, we're going to be having this conversation again with multiple people, so we'll see kind of just how everything flows with each individual, because these lovely ladies are all very different, um, but, you know, they're all incredible and, again, iconic. So you can add that to your resume, Bianca, that you're iconic. <laughs> I'll do that right now. Yeah, it's a good word. It's a good word for you. Um, okay, so the way a lot of women are viewed is always interesting and often built or designed or influenced by media and what we consume as individuals so a lot of it is also just kind of starting not only from our visual consumption but also what we read and um, what we hear and just in general how we experience the world so I wanted to ask uh, Bianca and Rach if you if you want to jump in as well as to what was the first time you consciously recognized like a cool chick that you may have found aspirational, um, maybe both in your real life uh, and uh, fictional. So like for me. Star Wars was like a big building block for like fandom things. Um, it wasn't like my first kind of fandom thing, but because the prequels were coming out when I was of a certain age and I was like, oh my God, like this queen and her like fighting like handmaidens, which is like so interesting and different, but it was also very lacking of like more for her. Like there was just like, there was lacking bits for her um, but I like how that basis, and so I delve deeper into the EU, and I feel like when I got into those things, when I read, like, Mara Jade, and, like, those really, like, individual characters that had, like, a better story or all those things, I was really empowered, and that sticks out to me because I think fandom for me has been a really integral part of a lot of, like, community building mm -hmm. for me and, like, community spaces that I've been in, and so I think having that and also because it was so different because I wasn't coming in just seeing that character from like a mainstream point of view like I was coming in having picked up these books from a library and so I wasn't coming in with like these preconceived notions and like the way that certain fanboys talk about her or how she'd been like over sexualized and fan art and all these other things um, like I didn't even see the comics which like gave her inner thigh padding on like a cat suit and I'm like who would do that no woman wants inner thigh padding like 
<laughs> what? Um, and anyway, but like that was really cool for me because it was just like this kind of almost isolated experience that like I think is so rare nowadays. Like even if it's a brand new thing, I feel like you're so often seeing it. Even like new things that are dropping from like Disney or anything else, like you're gonna already have people who who got press copies, so they're gonna already be giving like their opinions on something. Or um, even if you're watching live, people are going to be having, you know, some kind of reaction to it. So I think it was just such an interesting experience looking back where I was just like, the way that I can like talk, like experience this like strong, powerful woman and her story narratively is so different than like the way that everyone's talking about the prequels right now and like shitting on like everything. Um, so yeah, I think like, that was one of those like moments where I was just like, it's, that definitely affected not only how I took in that story, but I think also why it stuck with me because mm -hmm. it was just such a different way to consume and experience someone's narrative. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, when you, when you were consuming that, were you at like kind of at a point though where you were already just kind of um, critically thinking and examining just how everything was produced, therefore impacted your process? Or was that just something that just kind of happened organically and you... I feel like it just happened organically, but I also think that, like, it was an interesting time, so I feel like that was about junior high for me, that, like, that, like, all that was going on, and I think that was a time, too, as, like, a teenager, you start to build awareness around what you're being fed to yeah. think is, like, a standard versus not, so I don't think that, like, I was consciously as much, like, parsing those things out, but, like, looking back, it was definitely, like, there. It was just, like, so different an experience to be, like, how you interact with these things and how it affects you and impacts you. Um, it can be night and day. Yeah, for sure. Um, was there a, a large difference from like the characters that you were digesting when you were much younger as a little girl? I mean, yes and no. I'd say that like, I was an only child. So like I had a very weird, space like in terms of how I was brought up I was raised by like two older women because I was raised by my grandma and my great grandma and so I feel like I didn't interact with a lot of kids my age other than at school and a lot of like other girls really liked pop things like popular things mm -hmm. and I like I, I listened to popular music on the radio but I wasn't somebody who was like actually actively consuming those things quite often like mm -hmm. unless they were on a crossover episode of like Sabrina the Teenage Witch I didn't know who they were you know <laughs> like I was that kind of nerd because I spent like a lot of time um with books like I just my world was books and so I spent a lot of time there but it was my grandma was a teacher too and so a school teacher and so she very much was like you know skewing what I would read based on like things that she thought would be good for me and a lot of her stuff was she doesn't like any fantasy or science fiction so uh -huh. that was also a really important time for me because it, like getting into a space uh where I could be like not only do I have the autonomy to like pick up stuff that I think is different and good but also that I can find relatable uh I think was just like really interesting and different that's fascinating especially with just how much into science fiction you're you are now and how much of like that that's part of your world it's, it's fascinating how you kind of grew into that sometimes it's the things that parents want you to like stay away from the most that you're just going to gravitate toward more because you're just yeah it's different <laughs> like it's so you know, it's so different than anything you read. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rach, did you want to add anything like for just from like your own personal take as far as um, like a time you were consciously noticing a female character where you were like, wow, that's different and cool? Yeah, when we had Lizzie on, we actually started this whole kind of like chain of events of having Bianca mm -hmm. and um, and Letitia and Amanda to talk about women empowerment icons. And when we were talking about growing up, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we gleaned from our childhood obviously is like, you know, hindsight's 2020 20, because in the time you don't really think much about this is about women empowerment as a kid or as a teenager. Right. Um, right. And looking back on it, I, Lizzie pointed out, you know, a lot of the icons in pop culture that she looked up to were men because mm -hmm. in the spaces that she was um, 
enjoying fandom, there weren't many women empowering characters focused at the center. Um, and a lot of it usually was animated. So like the Disney princesses, um, I watched a lot of anime growing up. So Sailor Moon was a really big part of my life and seeing five women, young girls kind of taking control of their destinies and being superheroes, um, as well as being just teenage girls um, and being boy crazy and having all those facets to your personality. I thought like looking back now, I think that was a really great influence on me. And of course, because being Canadian and of Green Gables, like that was like a huge part of right. um, my literary childhood. So yeah, right. those were the two that stuck out. Yeah. Now, I remember when, when we were having that discussion with Lizzie, too, like I had brought up that there was um, a thing on Twitter that was trending at the time um, about um, like a character that you imagined yourself being when you were young, um, that because either you found them inspirational or aspirational, whatever. Um, and there were like, obviously, so many people retweeting it with, you know, gifts of or memes of um, the, their nostalgic characters or what have you. And I, I was brought to the conversation that I felt very, very strange because the only characters that kept coming to mind were men for me when I would think back on like just like childhood, really, really strong characters like Indiana Jones was probably the first one that popped into my head because I, I did go through that huge phase of like, oh, I want to be an archaeologist <laughs> just so that I could be like Indy. Um, and, um, and I... Uh, and going through like I started going through to see what other women were putting on and I did come across some women that put um um oh my god I'm blanking again my brain's not working fully um from the mummy Bianca should know this <laughs> are we just like <laughs> uh Rachel Weiss are we talking about yes okay I was like yes wait what from the mummy wait <laughs> is this a pop quiz <laughs> Rachel Weiss's character from the mummy yes I was like we need a character name like Evie Do yes we... okay. okay Evie thank you yeah I was trying to think of of the character name but I couldn't think of the character it's name. fine here we are <laughs> yes so um I did notice that a lot of women actually started to put Evie's character on there but Granted, that, that didn't come out until we were older. So that that's not necessarily, like, I guess it's nostalgic now, but um, not something that we would recall in, like, our very, very formative years. Uh, but it, it was a good example, and it started to make me think. It's like, yeah, we started to get these very, very strong characters that, because um, I would find, I, I would say that Evie is kind of comparable to an Indiana Jones type character, particularly once you get into the second movie, so on and so forth. Um, and so younger girls who got to see these movies were lucky enough to have that, to see that kind of um, character. Um, but the, I mean, similar to Bianca, the only one that I could think of that um, I thought was, that really made an impression on, on me as, in, at a very young age was Leia. Um, and being a princess, but being so distinctly different from our traditional Disney princesses, which were basically shoved down our throats our entire like youth. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, but still it was, it was interesting just kind of, it's weird when you when you do listen to your brain and you're like, why? Why is it a wasteland of just men? <laughs> so yeah, it's just it's weird. Yeah. But. And 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 part of the reason why this like new age renaissance of of Disney and Pixar movies that are centered around just regular girls and women, but them kind of owning who they are every awkward part of who they are and i feel like that's great for the next generation of girls watching these movies because we really didn't get that diversity of of types of characters not i'm not just talking about diversity in like in skin and culture but just the the types of characters um yeah i want to say that 
maybe Belle was like the turning point in a lot of ways because she loved to read and she um, was considered eccentric, even though she was like pretty and like like conventionally yeah. beautiful and I didn't understand she reads. Oh my, that's a terrible tree in a, <laughs> in a woman. Um, but yeah, it like I feel like in a lot of ways Disney's was great in centering these women as like being the main character of a story, but also not the greatest in the sense that every single one of those princesses had like pretty much the same personality. Yeah. And so yeah. they were all damsels in distress. Yeah. And like I as like a kid, I think that was something that I don't know if I was conscious of it, but I know that like I was like I don't relate. Like I don't feel any kind like when the other little girls in my like kindergarten and everything would be like freaking out about it, I just feel like I saw it once and I'm good. Like, you know, yeah. it, was, it was I had a very different response than I think a lot of my classmates. Like I think one of the first times I was like I would rewatch this. This is interesting. Was like Pocahontas, and like as an adult, obviously, I'm just like, oh my god, was that really all we had? Like, and definitely like Mulan, like that, like those to me hit so much differently as a kid than the kind of traditional princesses. And I don't think, I personally don't think it's just because I, I, you know, obviously part of it is because they're not white. I think that that's part of it, but they just felt very different in a few ways like a yes they're much more historical but like it just felt like there were moments of individual individuality um that I feel like I hadn't seen and heard in the other things like I think that's the thing that bugs me because like my husband and I kind of this back and forth he's like you totally like Belle and I'm like I think that's the thing though I think that we only had these like same archetypes but Belle was the only one that was like she was quirky because she liked to be like inside and read and like be intellectual, but that was seen as like a downside and like highly relatable, highly, so intensely relatable as the kid who would get in trouble for finishing my work early and read in the back of their classroom. Like that was me. Yep. Um, and I'm just like, it's one of the things that I, it, I'm glad to see such a diversity of heroines right now. Um, and again, you know, I'm not like a major Marvel fan, but like even watching WandaVision, I was just like, I love having a flawed heroine like uh, and like she doesn't have to necessarily be the villain but we can explore how like flawed people can exist in a world and like how like trauma can exist and be a thing that impacts you as a woman and you don't have to just continuously hold up this facade you know like it, yeah I definitely think that we're in a really really interesting time for you know, and, and, and we're going to keep being in a time. I think that's what's hopeful to me is that it feels yeah. like people are like, cool, but, and want to keep pushing how diversely we tell stories about people. I 100% yeah. agree. And I don't have anything against the damsel in distress kind of archetype. I'm okay with it in, in some ways, but when you get a repeated kind of pattern of the same thing over and over again that's when things start to get a little dicey i like the idea of women being all sorts of different characters like you said incredibly flawed because we had a string of um male-led television series that did really well yeah. with the main character being extremely flawed but still relatable and every badass like traditional badass woman was like always like in leather and like kicking the shit out of people but like there was like no other dimensions to her and I feel like that's we can't go from like damsel and distress princess to like badass woman that just like murders everybody in her way like there's there's no nuance there and so I feel like we're finally getting to the point where it's like we can have different types of women centered main characters like it's not just one extreme or the other it's like it's varied and and nuanced and complicated and messy but like completely relatable and so that's i have hope for like the next wave of of television and movies for that reason well that yeah. also goes behind like who's actually telling the stories right so we've had the same kind of people telling those stories and i think that those exact polar extremes that you described of like the damsel in distress and like the badass chick and leather that's just kicking ass and 
uh, maybe not even taking names, whatever, are like just male perceptions. They're male fantasies for the most part. Those are like the extremes there because they don't they don't understand the nuances more than half the time in between. I mean, they barely understand their own nuances for their own male characters most of the time because that involves recognizing feelings and stuff. So, um, and so I, I think ultimately everyone is kind of evolving more men and women to wanting more interesting character portrayals and stories uh, where they can recognize pieces of themselves that have maybe not been shown before. So, I mean, all of that goes into more um, interesting and detailed storytelling and richer storytelling. So that's a win-win for everyone ultimately. But um, Rach, you mentioned like seeing uh, this new wave of Pixar films uh, that are showing a greater example. I wanted to kind of dive more into um, some of the newer examples that you guys have come across um, that you feel is, is are just really strong, whether it's a particular writer or a show or film or book, anything that, that comes to mind that you've digested recently that you're like, oh my God, more people need to see this amazing thing. I just watched Turning Red this week and I'm 100% <laughs> just like, everyone needs to watch it. And then after I saw it was when I heard about like the one reviewer and I'm just like, this is a whole different um, conversation about how we need to change who the tastemakers are. We need yeah. to change how review culture works. We need to change the hierarchy of that. That's a whole part of, I think, unpacking some of this like like you're saying like it, it some of this goes to storytelling who gets to do this like there's a lot of nuance with budgets and production and having to get people on board for things and having to do all these studies about like we're gonna bring in this many people and this much money and it's a pain but like at the end of the day when you get to see not only yourself sometimes but like other people see themselves and find joy and it's just like really cool and it's just like there are a ton of things about turning around that like were not quote relatable for me but like it was good storytelling like it's just such good storytelling and I'm like I think that with so many people who get in that rut of like if it's not relatable it's not good and I'm like so you've only lived your life with things made for you that's what yeah. you told me like if those two things equal each other that's what you've just told everybody um but I thought like it was so sincere and like so like it just like was adorable and the fact that it was set in like 2002 gave me so many nostalgia feels you know like I think it was just like such a a, a well devised and plotted thing that like I'm sure like hits home for a lot of young folks too but like the nostalgia feels that like washed over me were just it was great it was fun it was really sweet Yeah, I 100% agree. I, I felt like when it was first announced that they were setting it in Toronto, that it was going to be very, like, Canadian, it was going to be in-your-face Canadian, and Canadians are not known to be, like, in-your-face patriotic. This was, like, very Canadian. It was, in my opinion, maybe too Canadian, and <laughs> that's saying a lot. <laughs> but um, I knew that when it was announced that we were going to get the type of reviews that we ended up did see see and then subsequently get removed and this wasn't the first time that a pixar movie had that sort of reaction of it's very limiting in scope when um when onward came out i remember reading um a review and i don't know if it's still out there and i don't i honestly don't remember who wrote it but basically the reviewer was saying it's limited in scope because it's a D, &D movie and girls don't play D, D and that was like basically there like girls won't relate women won't relate to this because they don't understand D, D. and i was like action adventure huh that's something that we can't relate to i it's about two brothers i'm like it's about family it's about grief losing a parent like those are universal things that a lot of people have went through and like that's probably one of the reasons why i related to it so much is like it reminded me of my relationship with my little brother so it's like just because you aren't exactly the person or the character that is being focused on doesn't mean you can't take away from the movie something that means something to you. I mean, we had movies about toys, about bugs, about feelings, about the afterlife. Things that we can't generally relate to, but stories about family, about finding your crew, about 
growing up feeling awkward and not knowing where you fit in the world. Like, those are universal things. If you can't see that, then what are you doing reviewing film, in my opinion? It's like, if you can't see the underlying messages of what's in a movie, what are you doing reviewing movies? I mean, they're doing it for the clout. As someone who, like, went to J school with people who their whole career goal was, I want to be a reviewer. I'm like, there's, like, but why? And, like, not having a why, I think, is a, is a thing that I saw a lot of. It was people who were just, they just wanted to go, they wanted to go into sports reporting because it seemed glamorous. They want to go into reviews because it means that you get early access. You get to do all these fancy things. And I'm just, like, I, I've seen that kind of, I think, especially with how blogs have been able to become legit media sources and legit things that now are added to press lists. I think that's really critical because it, it helps with equity. But I also think it's it's shining more and more light on what most people have been saying for a long time, which is we don't have a diversity of reviewers in like some of these major publications. And that's why we had to make our own blogs, our own like fandom spaces that then became legit so that we could get those press passes. But now that we're doing that, we need to continue to have the conversation about who gets the access for this and who like the fact that like places are not intentionally going to folks that are being incent like that are their community centered in those things and going we want to hire you to review this mm -hmm. is just like the most basic thing you could do if you're like we don't have anybody on staff let's find some money for this or we shouldn't review it like like if if you're going to be i don't know i'm just like there are ways to do it i know this from like having worked inside like media spaces i just think there are a lot of people who just don't think about it and don't care to think about it and I think too in that that space has been so untouchable for so long because they've hidden behind well it's reviews it's honest like we have to you know and I think like there are a lot of white men who've hit, really made a career hiding behind that and I'm like I mean your time is over your time is long past gone yeah yeah but at least a monopoly of it for sure like that's yeah. just like it it, it's it just can't it's not sustainable anymore yeah it's one so thing hard. i did notice though with reviews and it's something that i've noticed recently even though it's kind of like you can feel it like it tickle the back of your mind and you just qu can't quite wrap your brain around it is the fact that a lot of reviewers will use the phrase the film did not resonate with me um and I used to use that a lot with like music that didn't resonate with me or with television shows that didn't resonate with me. And I had to sit back and think, why did it not resonate with me? Um, mm -hmm. And it, I think it's okay to not like, you can't like everything. That's, you know, I, you're going to have preferences. But in a lot of ways, the underlying message of when I read, it did not resonate with me is it did not resonate with me because I didn't choose to look further into how that story could have resonated with me. I just saw on the surface what didn't kind of um, relate to me. And so I chose not to. Or I just decided to write something off immediately because the main character didn't look or have the same experiences that I do. And so we're very closed off into like seeing the same thing over and over again it's the same reviewers that 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 um that are complaining that there's too much diversity now out there it's like wh why right. why is it necessary for you to see yourself in a character on screen and i'm like you don't understand the significance of it because you've got to see yourself on screen multiple mm -hmm. times in different like, varied well, ways well why are you bitching about not being able to see yourself in this thing exactly if it's not important. it's the same people though like the intersection of people yeah. saying oh i don't this doesn't resonate with me is the same as like well why do you care that you know a main character looks like you why do you care that your stories are being told and right. the idea yeah. that something that doesn't resonate with you is a story that shouldn't be allowed to be told is a very dangerous thing that's happening in movie in the land of critics because i feel like that's right. something that gets said a lot it's okay that it doesn't resonate with you i understand that but i think it's time to like dig deeper as to why 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 does it not resonate with you and if the reason is something that makes you uncomfortable then maybe that's something that's worth exploring 
Do you realize how many other issues would be solved, though, if people actually just paused and asked that more in-depth question for them to just, like, analyze themselves about, like, why didn't this resonate? Because, <laughs> I mean, we're just talking surface, like, stuff right now, but there are much bigger things that come into play that would just with that one little question a lot of things could probably get solved because there would be a lot more understanding. I also think I mean, it, it shines a spotlight on a life experience, which is, yeah. oh, like, honestly, like, me being like, I, like, or, and even you, like, us all talking about how like, it was so many masculine heroes, masculine-centered things when we were growing up, and it's just like, oh, so we grew up with a bunch of stuff that wasn't centering us and we still consumed it? Like, yeah. yeah. It just tells me everything about someone's, like, privilege when they can come at something that they are not centered in, and instead of, like, I'm totally, like, I'm not saying every review ever has to be positive, but if you're not doing, like, you're saying this intellectual work to be, like, not just, I couldn't relate to it, so it's bad, but, like, what is actually happening here? I think that's, like, actual review writing. That's actual good critique and doing critical work. I just feel like um, some people have skated by on being really quick, quippy. I think that's, that's their thing. Yeah. That they've just skated by on like, that's their thing. And it's like, that can't be everyone's thing because it's not a thing. It's just the thing. Like, yeah, have a personality. Yeah. They're know. being honest. <laughs> Whatever. I feel like I would actually read more of them if they were a little bit more personal about it of like, yeah, this didn't resonate with me because, and actually giving an explanation. I was like, yeah, I sat, I sat back a little bit, analyzed this, and this is why. Because I feel like that at least is their truth, which gives it some legitimacy versus just some rando blanket statement of without any explanation or some bullshit explanation about it not being universally <laughs> Yeah, Not and I think I think that's what actually got the reviewer um, about turning red was his explanation on why it didn't resonate with him, and po- he pointed out like no one's gonna relate to a to a Chinese Canadian thirteen year old you know high schooler. Um, so tell me you're not racist without telling me you're racist, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah. It, it, when when you ask yourself that question, why did it not resonate with with me? And then explain it, and then you ha- you show your real colors. People like they're not dumb. Like we can we can yeah. read between the lines. You're pretty you're pretty much Absolutely. saying that you know you obviously don't care because the main character does not look like you. And, and I think that's the good because he day. completely outed himself, and that's just another way to take out the trash. So I feel like everyone should just let like air out their dirty laundry, and then that way we know where <laughs> that way we know where to go. Like mm-hmm. ultimately, I don't. I mean, that was his pro. He he sat down and wrote all that and, and thought it was okay. He did, and then not only that, other people said it was okay. Yeah, yeah. The because editor well, of the. <laughs> of that of that website was like, yeah, publish it. I think what's worse was when he was called out about it and he apologized. I felt like the apology was very much like, I don't think I worded it correctly. I'm like, oh, no, 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 sir. You wrote, worded it exactly, exactly correct. If you have a yeah. career, if you have a career in words, you know what you said. Right. Like, yeah. no, I just think that like, that's the, I think all of this really comes down to like, what does introspection really look like? And I think that a lot of folks think that they can just make an apology and that's it. And I think that, like, you're right, like, they can totally take the tra- like take themselves out to the trash and, like, just show themselves for being the trash they are. But I also yeah. think that, like, in this, we also have, are going to deal with the repercussions of people who are continuously still think that a blanket apology is an apology when it shows no remorse. Right. Yeah. Just another... That's a whole other lesson, because I, I think we've had that conversation, haven't we, <laughs> Just like, what a good apology is or something like that, because I think some some stuff had happened before where we were like, yeah, this needs a whole conversation. On. <laughs> so... I, I, I think for me, I would much rather them, through their actions, show that they've apologized, 
instead of saying some trite words that every other person could just throw out there saying i'm sorry say what you're gonna do what 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 are you gonna do to better yourself and to under to be more understanding of the situation are you gonna educate yourself more are you going to reach out to people in the community and see what you can do to help them in their community elevate voices in that community like give me a tangible thing to say that you actually are remorseful i don't care that you're sorry i care that you're wanting to change i care that you want to elevate voices i care that you um want to reach out to the community that you hurt because apologizing to us the general public in the space of twitter in the space of facebook in the space of any social media is not apologizing to the community that you've hurt. Right. And if you were truly sorry for what you've said or what you've done, then that should be, that should be how you ask for forgiveness. And you have to also understand that people might not forgive you and you have to be okay with that. Cause like, you know, when, when a community is constantly struggling and constantly being hurt by the people that are saying that, you know, we're, we're trying to represent a certain group of people or we're trying to represent um critics and like this also brings down critics too because people that are legitimately criticizing pieces of art that are dangerous to certain groups of people that um are portraying things that are very stereotypical and 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 not good for for, for filmmaking they get drowned out because they get pinned as being well you're being too like critical about certain things can why don't you just let people enjoy the things that they enjoy so you get those two sides of um of critics not getting the respect that they deserve for when they do call out things that are racist or homophobic or transphobic or ableist um because you have people that are sitting here saying this doesn't resonate with me because it's about it's about an experience that I never got to experience. So it, it, it it's it's bad on both ends. And I can see like legitimate people that are like criticizing the the heavily racist, you know, <laughs> stuff in fandom getting told, well, you guys are just complaining all the time. And that's not okay either. So it's like finding that right balance of like being aware of like what does resonate with you what doesn't resonate with you and what actually needs to be improved in the industry so it's it's really it's really tough for everybody involved when you have people kind of like being privileged this entire time and and saying whatever the heck they want and calling it honesty and getting away with it and and then just apologizing and moving on i think that that's something that that definitely needs to be talked about a little bit more it's like what Bianca was saying, who actually gets to decide these things? Who actually gets to have a say? Who actually gets to have a seat at the table to have an opinion? Because that's, at the end of the day, that's super important. Because if it's the same people all the time, we're going to have this hierarchy and gatekeeping of what is actually considered good television and film versus what's bad because of what resonates with the people that are at the table. And also, like, eventually the question of who gets paid, which is a whole different conversation. Because, like, oh, God. Like, so <laughs> many, like, reviewers that are minorities of any marginalized community, like, a lot of their portfolio is going to be unpaid or, like, like very little yeah. pay work in a way that, like, a lot of, like, their white counterparts don't experience. Um, but again, that's, like, a whole other thing. It's just, it's, it's a multi-pronged... Yeah, it is. It 100% is. Yeah. It, it, it all really comes down to, like, it is hard um, to change, especially certain industries where that's just been the standard, where, like, there has been a lot of, like, white supremacy problems in media. And I think that, like, even when I left my last newsroom in 2020, there was just a lot of not grappling with it because people just really think that, like, you know, you can have a staff meeting and it's fine, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah what's the status quo right it's again it's like it's just that complacency and not wanting to like go against the grain because i mean people know that it takes work and listen um, journalists love whistleblowers unless it's at their own organization right yeah (laughs) i can tell you that 100 percent. they love it unless it's about the place that they work at and then they try to absolutely hush it up yep yep i believe it i mean Um, we we saw a lot of that happening during during the uh 
the last two and a half years with the pandemic and stuff of like um, big yeah. social media presences and journalistic presences getting taken down by their employees of color because they were yeah. not paid period <laughs> it was just they were not paid not not a matter yeah. of being paid enough or p- being paid equal they weren't they weren't paid period so it's yeah, it's definitely something to like change the institution, and obviously that's going to take time and effort. But mm-hmm. there is progress happening. It's just it seems very slow a lot of the time. What's well, gonna? It's gonna be slow, but it's also just like it's the clamoring, and it's gonna get really, really loud from uh, the more offensive side too. Just because um, it's like it's like the the last screams of a dying dictatorship. It's like as yeah. soon as there's like some some movement in in that progress to where they're going to lose a little bit of power they're obviously just going to like tooth and claw and just bitch and moan as much as they possibly can because it's you know the end of reality as they know it yeah Mm -hmm. what's that what's that quote it's like equality feels like oppression if you were always in the majority yep that's it Mm mm-hmm that's it. Mm-hmm. That's the money. Yep. <laughs> um, okay, back to back to the lighter stiffs um, before we have to wrap up. Because I think, what, Rach, what time did we start? Do we still have like maybe 15, 20 minutes? Yeah, we have like 15, 20 minutes. We, we start a little bit late. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so we mentioned turning red and something that was that we've we've talked about turning red a multitude of times and Bianca I don't know if you if you saw but we were tweeting a little bit that the uh four friend characters reminded us of us so we felt that Pixar owed us funds for stealing our friendship and putting it on screen (laughs) I will co-sign this I will support this you have me here on stream supporting this I saw a couple of the tweets I think yeah I was just like Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but we also have to show a lot of a lot of love to the uh, production team because I, I believe that this was the first Pixar film that was done by all women in production. Majority. Majority. It's majority of the artistic team was were, were, were okay. female, and okay. many women of color. Yes. Yes. So that was that's 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 props on uh, Disney Pixar for actually, but. I mean, ultimately, that's also, I think, what's so great about this particular film, because I do think that going back to what we were talking about, about showing a character um, or characters with all of their imperfections, flaws and quirks. um, And ultimately, it's just all it's all very, very endearing and realistic because we can all relate like we're ultimately if if there's anyone here, particularly anyone who watches us, that would dare to admit that they're not a walking goob, you are lying. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like it's just it's just it, it was just so cute and relatable, and um, and all I could see was Rachel. <laughs> I have to say, growing up, everyone had, like, that Disney princess that they were like, this is my princess. And as much as I loved Mulan, I never identified with her entirely because she was very, like, thin and tall and, like, traditionally light-skinned. And so I didn't feel like I was Mulan. Like, I loved her and I and, and I adored her because she was, like, the first time that I watched, like, a Western, a Hollywood production with, like, an Asian woman in the center of it. And so I was just like, yeah. wow, this is amazing. I feel seen. But, like, Turning Red was the first time where I was like, it's a little Chinese-Canadian girl and, like, super awkward. And I'm like, I have my princess. <laughs> this is her. <laughs> I have the person that I'm like, that is exactly who my princess, if I had May when I was like a little girl, I think I would have turned out to be a very different person. I Like, honestly, I think I would have been way more comfortable in my skin. I would have felt like I didn't have to have everything all together or I didn't have to like know that I had to have everything all together. And so it was just like, I've in my 30s, I feel seen as like a 13 year old in the in the in the early 2000s which is like roughly i mean i was a little younger at that time but like roughly my adolescence 
and like yeah. boy bands were a huge thing the jelly bracelets were a huge thing um the barrettes like her little barrettes i'm like i still oh, have yeah. clips somewhere in my drawer like exact same <laughs> clips and so i like i'm finally seen in a in a in an animated um in an animated disney slash pixar production so it's i'm like i'm letter. done i'm happy <laughs> give me more exactly. but i'm also happy <laughs> yeah I was, there was a tiktok that uh my husband sent me that was basically like um folks that were like like someone was coming in the room being like i mean turning around was good but like now i'm like re-experiencing like childhood trauma and Encanto is like here have some wine and i'm just like oh hello <laughs> uh and i'm like yeah uh uh-huh that's where i am too i, I totally like i have only seen Encanto once because it was a lot for me, it is a yeah. lot for me. My dad came here uh, because of a civil war in El Salvador, uh, and I grew up on war stories. And I'm just like, oh, oh, we went right and targeted <laughs> the girl with the short hair and glasses. That's weird yeah. in the family. Mm, great, cool. I'm gonna like watch this once and then not talk about it again. <laughs> yep, I had I had a very very similar experience, and I and I told the girls because we did um. A, a podcast episode for um our actual podcast podcast is on the list on it and I told the girls because Rach and Jen had a very emotional reaction to it instantly and mine triggered my um ancestral and emotional trauma so acutely that I emotionally shut down so I didn't even respond emotionally like I was just a zombie when I watched it and I was like something's wrong because i normally cry at everything coping mechanism that we yeah. Have developed yeah yeah and it was just but it, it i did pause and i was just like okay well i mean if rach is crying at it and jen's crying at it because i normally cry at everything like at the drop of a hat if it's like if it's warm and fuzzy or whatever i usually cry at it so i was like this is there's something not right and i had to rewatch it and actually let my like let myself like take the wall down a little bit and actually process it and i was like oh that's why <laughs> so yeah it, it was it was a lot for me too it's a um, lot sometimes it, it like that's the plus minus sometimes right of finally seeing yourself it's that like yeah because so many of us have been bereft of anything that actually came that close when yeah. you see it it's just a lot to take in and i think that like you know or as commercial as some people could argue things are, I'm still like, there's something to be said for art form. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I find it really fascinating that growing up, I didn't feel like I was missing anything. Like, looking back, I'm like, I didn't feel like I was missing anything being represented on the screen. I didn't feel like it was necessary until I was, like, in the theater watching Crazy Rich Asians, and it, like, really dawned on me how much it, like, actually truly meant like it i might have not cognizantly like thought about it but in that moment i was like i get it now and like i remember sitting in the theater and like i don't even i don't even think it was like a particularly um emotional scene but i just like remember like i just started crying because i was just like i don't think i've seen something like this in a theater full of other asian canadian human beings and like mm -hmm. experiencing it together like this i watched um joy luck club in in high school and that was probably one of like the first also experiences where we're like oh okay it's like an all asian cast that's something that was very striking to me and they were and they were speaking english in this film and it was like wow um but like crazy rich asians like it wasn't like it was like the best movie in the world it wasn't like it was it but it had so much pressure on it to like do well because if it didn't do well that meant that closed the door on a lot of projects i'm still waiting on projects like similar where it's like you know give me all the asians um but i also want that for like all representation of asians i want more south indian rep uh, south asian representation i want more southeast asian representation there's still so much more that we could be doing yeah. Um, and I feel like we're, you know, we're just at that cusp but at the same time. It's like something like that happens. You would think that there would be more. You would think that there would be, um, an immediate. Yeah. yeah. It's like, this is validation that these kind of movies will do well. And I still don't think we're at that point yet. 
I'm I'm seeing I, I, progress, but it's not to the point where it's like we kick the door down. How many doors do we have to continually kick down in order for us to get enough? Um, and I think part of it is caught up in how production works and how yeah. all that stuff is tied into years ahead of time getting yep. that into place. I think that like that's part of why that has just been such a struggle. Um, mm-hmm. It's not all of it, but I think that like especially when I talk to like Amanda Ray about like production and stuff, like when people are like, I don't understand why this can't instantly be here. It's like, it's, there's a whole, the whole behind the scenes thing on why this happens the way it does. Right. The decision makers and getting everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. But yeah, I mean, just to, I I know Rachel and I know partly it's like a, it's a joke that you, that you stated about, um, all of these cultural relevant films that we've had, like Turning Red and Encanto being so triggering. And you were like, well, this is great, but can we get them without the emotional trauma? Yeah. Can we take a but, slow um, roll on the generational trauma for like at least one or two movies? Because that would be really nice. <laughs> Having Encanto and Turning Red back to back was less like, to for my heart was like, I feel seen. This is really yeah. triggering wonderful because we're like processing this um but i would like some joy as well for the people of color that would be really nice at some point (laughs) yeah 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 we don't have to stuff all of the emotions into one like let's let's leave the generational trauma like maybe out of the next one yeah you know it's like we get it we have to fix the general trauma the generational trauma has to end with us we get it (laughs) She's been the star. We get it. Yeah. Let's let her take the back seat. She can be a supporting role in something else. For sure. Yeah, no, I, I feel like, I mean, it's probably a little bit of like the catch up game, too, because if, if if we go back to the nostalgia stuff and the things that we grew up with and how um, white and male they were, um, they 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 reached a point of just because of how many stories have been told for that particular audience to those fantastical levels that we're hoping for, and um, or at least something that just sparks more joy and it is a little bit more light and maybe you know some adventure some fantasy something like that with people that look like us, um, that would be great and and I know that maybe science fiction has always been a little bit ahead of the curve as far as to women characters in particular and um, strong female characters from Star Trek, Star Wars, all that jazz. Um, But I don't know if that's also partially just like a little bit insulting of the fact that that opportunity was in science fiction because it's science fiction. (laughs) It's a fantasy Um, world. Yeah, it's a fantasy world in which these amazing women characters are existing and why can't it be in a more realistic realm and I love and maybe that's that's actually what pushed me towards science fiction because I fucking love science fiction like science fiction fantasy that's those are my genres that's what that's what I like watching that's what I like consuming mostly and I don't know if maybe that is why uh because that's just where I saw more of the interesting women being written but i think too it's going to be one of those things that like in generations like to come we'll have much more nuanced conversations about that Mm -hmm. because i feel like a lot of me is like so much of the original trilogy for star wars was edited by like george's wife like Mm -hmm. she like really helped (laughs) Yeah. like take stuff that like really was not amazing and like really like helped form things um yep. and there's also like you know when you have two actors that actually are like actively having an affair then if your writing's not great the actual sexual tension is doing a lot of work for you so I think there's a lot to be said for like how this kind of early big these big um franchises are going to age in a certain way as far as intentionality and I think too looking at how um discovery is that the the current one um like how there is intention in the writing there versus where i think a lot of the early especially when i was at star wars i'm like oh buddy i don't think there was intention written 
you know, completely in here. So I think that like when we get to a place where we can have not only all the people in the room, but also I hope one day a franchise that is built upon um, actual diverse minds coming to the yeah. table and having that intentionality written throughout, I think it'll be such a different experience. I just think mm -hmm. from the get go, that will be a completely just different realm. Yeah. Yeah. No, as sure. much as I'm like totally like yes let us please like in the new Lord of the Rings thing you know like let's cast people of color like let's do that I still of, am of the mind of I really think we can keep exploring other people that are diverse writers like, I think we can not tell the same stories over and over over and over yeah yeah agreed Definitely. that would be that would be ideal and that would be great and also just original women's work <laughs> there's a lot out there to be done yeah um i wanted to touch a little bit on um the classic icon definition because i feel like a lot of um classic icons for women when we look back, particularly like in old school Hollywood, like we had so many labels like the bombshell, the femme fatale, like all of those kinds of words that were used. Um, was there a particular like Hollywood classic icon that you found particularly strong? No. <laughs> okay. I don't feel like I was really drawn to that. Like, I think mm -hmm. that, yeah, I don't think I was ever really drawn into those things. Yeah. I definitely have certain feels about how, like, the femme fatale can, like, often be seen as, like, evil. Right. Just, like, by default. I have certain feels on, like, how, like, the male gaze really mm -hmm. does a number on all, all those things. Yeah. It kind of goes back to that extreme what we were talking about like going like from the damsel of distress to like that crazy chicken leather <laughs> yeah and there's a lot Just of those movies the yeah there's a lot yeah there's a lot um I, I i feel like for i did grow up on a lot of really old school black and white films um mainly because my mom was born in 1942 so my mom is a particularly of an older gen um comparatively to a lot of people that are my age and um i i was i was really kind of breaking it down to see like if there were particular women that kind of really got the parts that kind of held their own against their male counterparts in some films and I felt that, um, I, th I think a lot of names that kind of come to mind are like the Catherine Hepburns um, and, um, oh my God, why can't I think of her? This is just bad that I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but I can think of her male counterpart. That says something. <laughs> Doesn't it though? It does. Yeah, Catherine. Call. Catherine sticks out in my in my head in terms of just like classic yeah. Hollywood icons. Especially in yeah. her later years. She just commands attention when she's on the screen. Um which yeah. I didn't well, feel I mean, like she... other actresses on the same level did. No. Um and she made a point to to uh like wear pants. I think she was one of the first ones that would be like in as the leading lady, like dressing a certain way, being a little bit more boyish, uh, having that kind of tomboy flair and just wearing it, doing it, using it and still being very, very attractive and being able to tell the story and not being like this distracting, like girly girl damsel in distress sort of thing, um, which she could still do obviously, but she would do it by choice. <laughs> um, so I thought she she was particularly strong. I thought Lauren Bacall could really hold her own, particularly as um, she was ridiculously young when she started doing um, movies with uh, with Bogey. Um, but I think she was another one where she was just she had this very very deep voice, and yeah, she was very striking. 
um, but she wasn't like your traditional beauty. She had a little bit more sharp uh, features, which I mean, back in those days, unfortunately, that those were like the little subtleties that really made the difference where, you know, you're looking at, at someone who, who is a bombshell um, and then someone who's getting these parts that just have a little bit more bite to them, I guess. Um, and so I do, I do feel that there, there probably is some analysis out there that really kind of dives into these women that started out in the, particularly in the film industry in those early days that maybe started knocking down some doors for some ladies now. But um, again, granted, the majority of them were white, so, mm -hmm. or white passing, so. It was of the time, for sure. Twas. Twas. Uh, Liz brought up sure. Betty Davis in the chat. Betty Davis is a good one. Yeah. She was quite the strong bee. <laughs> um, well, ladies, um, I didn't have necessarily a very clean conclusion to end this with, but I thought maybe it would be keen to um, maybe list off another favorite character or two. I'm trying to think in terms of recent. Yeah, if it, if it recent, the better, because then people can kind of venture out and see if there's something new that they can digest. That's good representation of a, of a very well-written woman. It's funny that the most most of the time when we talk about women empowerment, like I have a lot of animated stuff and particularly like Eastern animated stuff. Um, <laughs> like it's it's funny because like growing up, I, I couldn't identify with a lot of things um, pop culturally because there weren't that many like girls being centered around it, but like, you know, like I said, Sailor Moon, all of all of most of the Miyazaki films are centered around little girls and and kind of just like their transition um, through life. And so it's it's interesting that the types of female characters that are written in Asia are are very different than the ones that are written um, in Hollywood. Yeah, I mean it's not surprising, but. <laughs> It is, it's, it's striking to me. Yeah. Gosh, why can't I think of anything? That's, that's not good either. <laughs> it's sad, isn't it? It's tough. It is, I feel like, especially because as I've gotten older, I think I bring a more critical eye mm -hmm. to what I'm consuming. So I feel like there's less of the kind of like sparkle that you have when you're a kid and you're kind of going in a little bit like less jaded maybe yeah <laughs> um some folks that i think have been doing really interesting heroines i think is where i can get mentally which is um i think olivia dade has been writing really wonderful um women and she specifically has fat heroines and like specifically i think in the way that she handles that in her work it doesn't in the books that I've read, it doesn't really default to let's relive all the trauma of that we've already seen in a lot of things that center fat women. Mm -hmm. It it has like they can have trauma that doesn't always have to center their body in that way, which I think is so different. Um, then and I feel like the the folks that I know that like do that resonates with them, like those stories. It is nice for them to read that because then they can talk about the joy the heroine's fine versus just that with just and they're constantly being tormented by this cycle of pain which i think is important as we were kind of talking about earlier um i just read the love con and that was like about this is like a while ago actually but like basically it like centers like a nerdy girl who's trying to like win this like costume contest and like she has all these pressures of like her family wanting her to like live up to these like an engineering degree and she's like listen I'm just like those black chubby nerds like I just want to live my life and like I don't know it was, I, I was really struck by how like authentic the character felt like to like people that I've like like I know but also to like fandom spaces and I feel like 
I think that's what like sticks with me more and more. And maybe this is like the adult version of like the I can't relate to the hol- to the princesses, but right. like I am seeking out those narratives that do feel less cookie cutter, essentially, where it's like give me something different, give me something that like breathes, that like feels living and breathing. And I think those were some of my recent reads that I was like, this just feels strikingly different um, in the way that like these women get centered in their stories and like also just as heroines completely. That's brilliant. I love that. I need a, I need a Bianca book club list. Oh yeah. <gasps> no, because it's just mostly me reading just <laughs> so much romance lately. So much romance. There's nothing There's wrong, nothing with, wrong that. with that. No. I know, but I, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, so I don't know how sustainable that is. <laughs> well, those, I'm going to take those recs, because I'm all in. I, yeah. I've been reading a lot of just considered, like, trashy romance novels, and, like, I don't like that term anymore, or it being, yeah. like, a guilty pleasure, because it kind of downplays the fact that this genre is always much, like, it's looked down upon, but, like, really, it's, like, one of the most successful genres. Yeah. It yeah, makes the, one of the most money in the industry. And I feel like sometimes the world is shitty and you just want to get into like a really just silly ro- like silly romance. There's nothing wrong with it. It's it not, is, you know. It is exactly that. I find the most comfort knowing that I know how the story is going to end. I don't have yeah. to worry. Yeah. As much as I just said the thing with the cookie cutter, I think that like specifically there's something we said for finding comfort in reading. Also, uh, you over there with your um, Anne of Green Gables. Have you read The Blue Castle? I have not. I've heard. I, I've had so many friends go, you need to read, you need to read, you need to read. And it's like, it's been sitting there in the back of my mind. And I haven't, I haven't gone around to it yet, no. I am not. Sorry, I'm going to offend everybody. I'm not a Green Gables fan. Um, just never really clicked with me. I, I love this. I love sleeves of that era. I just don't love not in love with that story i don't know i also don't like little women if you need one more thing that i don't like um but i'm like, okay with little women but it's not like the be all end all yeah that I, I make, feel people like make it like, up to me <laughs> i feel like i'm just not drawn to those in the way that like the people that i know yeah who do like them like love it and i'm just like i don't know i wasn't big um, on the books i'm i'm definitely yeah. very drawn to megan follows his, portrayal of Anne there's something really just genuinely sincere about the way that she played her um the books were okay I was forced to read the books in school and so it doesn't feel like I connected to the books as much as I did Megan's kind of like portrayal of her so she is my Anne (laughs) I highly highly suggest if you have time checking out the blue castle and along with that bonnet that Dawn did a read along with that so they have a podcast that kind of supplements it as well um and it was just really interesting. I I just really appreciated the kind of it was unexpected for me. I just I didn't think I'd love it, and I was like, oh dang, I want to reread this. Like this was, it was like the first time I read ten of Wild Bell Hall, and I was like, I actually enjoy Bronte. I actually don't hate this Bronte. Hmm. Okay, you're 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 now gonna be the person that finally gets me to read okay. this because I yeah. I've heard it multiple times from people. I don't know if it's like it's really striking because it's so different or if it's if it's actually like good I'm just gonna say that (laughs) like there's just times where I'm like I don't know I can't think too hard about it but um I'm curious what you think as someone who's already had to read Green Gables I also desperately wanted my hair to be red well we told you you should still get that wig especially now that turning red came out like i feel like you could rock a red wig (laughs) i feel like it needs to be a certain red you can get that you can get that for sure karma says vc andrews novels were my guilty pleasure books i feel like we need to all start removing guilty pleasure out of our vocabulary Yeah. yeah If anyone makes you feel guilty about something that brings you pleasure, they can fuck off. Just sure. generally speaking. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Alright. Rach, shall we outro this? Yes, let's find someone to raid. 
um thank you bianca it's always a pleasure to have you on you're always so yes, super absolutely. insightful and yes. we love having yes. you as a guest so thank you thank you thank you for having me uh i appreciate everything that i'll do and i appreciate getting to chat with you you brilliant brilliant people we love you so much you are an icon <laughs> I mean, I have icons for my social media pages, but like, I don't think that's the same. Speaking of social media, please follow Bianca on all the socials. I'm dropping her links in the chat. I'm also dropping the raid messages, so um, you can copy yeah. and paste those raid messages. If you're a subscriber, you can copy and paste that first one. If you're not, you can copy and paste that second one. Thank you to Liz and Lynette for resubscribing to our tiny little corner of space. We appreciate you guys. You are the best humans. Um, I think we're going to kick you. things over to Jen and Jerome because they are hosting a charity stream right now um, to help the efforts in the Ukraine. So we are going to kick things over to them. I do want to say that we will be participating in a charity stream. And by we, I think it's just me. So you're stuck with me, guys. You're stuck. Um, mm -hmm. This Saturday at 1 p.m. Pacific on our channel. We are going to be raising funds for the AAPI Rise Up effort for Tonga Relief. They are still struggling um, with um, rebuilding, and um, it's going to be super fun. There's a lot of people that are involved. Um, JP, who's in the chat, is one of those fine people involved. Um, so it's happening over to, um, the span of two Saturdays, and it starts this Saturday. And we're participating on the 19th, and so we're going to be all together raising money for um, the disaster relief for Tonga. Um, we'll have more details and we have a little video that Kaz put together to talk about the fund that we are going to be donating towards. There's going to be some really amazing giveaways. Uh, Jace, our lovely friend Jace the Collector, has graciously donated a Sune for us to, to, um, to raffle off during our stream in particular. And the other streamers that are involved, the Average Nerd Podcast, um, Kaz in April, um, Jura Moriarty, um, they'll be painting one of one Sunes, custom Sunes that they will also be raffling off. So I think it's every $5 or $10 donation. I can't remember. I'm so sorry. But if you join us, uh, we'll have the actual um, rules on how to enter. And you just have to take a screen cap of your donation to the fund and you get entered into the draw. And we'll be drawing it, I believe, on the Monday, uh, the 28th on the Average Nerd Podcast. Um, their stream on Mondays. So help the people of Tonga and have a chance to win a Asune. I feel like that's a it's a win 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 for everyone involved. All the wins. Yes. So let's start this raid to Jen and Jerome. Please give them a follow if you're not following them. They are a lovely streaming couple. Um, they recently got married and so they're now husband and wife and they're gaming together. And gamers that game together, stay together, I think. So let's mm -hmm. kick things over to them. Thank you again to Bianca for joining us. We can't wait to have you back. Yep. And yeah. Y'all are amazing. Ditto. Bap. All right. Oh, we have an outro. I forgot totally about it. Um, until we see you guys next, please remember to continue wearing your masks. Get vaccinated if you can. Get that booster if it's available. Don't be a dick and stay curious. Thank you, everyone. We will see you Saturday. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye.